National Defenders of McHenry County's, this is a long name, Water and Natural Resources Protection Action Team. And these BMP talks and tours are coordinated by our team together with the McHenry County um, Planning and Development part Department. So um, we're very excited to have you here today. This is our second year of talks and tours. I think t today is the uh, fifth tour of this year. Um, really looking forward to hearing from Crystal Lake staff today. Our next tour is coming up, I believe, September 22nd, and we're starting to think about winter coming up. It'll be on sensible salting. So I'm going to turn it over to Scott Kuykendall, who's with our team and also with the county, and he'll give you some background for today. So, hello everybody. Uh, I think I know most of you, but my name is Scott Kuykendall. I'm the Water Resource Specialist for the McHenry County Department of Planning and Development, where I help oversee our scientific research into water. I help set public policy. I maintain the county's environmental compliance with our EPA permits, and then do public education and outreach like this. And uh, so today we're going to be focusing on uh, green infrastructure. And I'm just kind of curious, I think most people know the, the term. Is there anybody who isn't familiar with the term uh, green infrastructure? Um, so when we talk about green infrastructure, it's often ca also called uh, uh, nature-based solutions. So nature has had four and a half billion years of research and development. And uh, nature does things with very low energy inputs. Uh, it's a very efficient way of doing things. And uh, in our built environment, uh, we've tried to force our will upon nature, and often that has negative repercussions. So historically, flooding occurred mainly in uh, floodplain. Uh, but now uh, over 95% of flood damage in Illinois occurs outside of the floodplain. Uh, and that's due in large part to urbanization, uh, but also because we are actually getting greater and greater amounts of precipitation. So after the past 50 year, over the past 50 years, we've had a steady incline and increase in the amount of precipitation we're getting, but we're getting it in fewer and fewer storm events. So the intensity of our storms is increasing. And our built environment just is not made to handle that uh, extra rainfall. And so how are we going to adapt our built environment to manage uh, water uh, during increased precipitation events and as we continue to urbanize? And green infrastructure really is one of the most powerful tools that we have in our toolbox to address flooding. And uh, one of the reasons why green infrastructure or nature-based solutions really work in our area in particular is our native plants are deep-rooted. Uh, so our plants, uh, uh, root zones will go down 5 feet, 10 feet, up to 15 feet, but it's create, that root zone creates basically a massive sponge. So it's able to hold an enormous amount of water, it's able to promote infiltration, it can uh, evapotranspire large amounts of water, uh, so it's really a powerful tool for managing stormwater in our built environment. Uh, but it's also important because it provides a multitude of benefits. Uh, so you, many of you have already heard me talk about this, but I use the example of a storm sewer. So a storm sewer's function is to move water from point A to point B. But you can do that same conveyance from point A to point B with a bioswale. So a bioswale is a, a concave depression that's designed to move water from point A to point B, uh, but it's typically planted with native deep-rooted native vegetation. And so it's providing that conveyance, but it's also cleaning the water as it passes through, th through the water's interaction with uh, the, the vegetation and soils. Um, it's promoting infiltration. Uh, you can design it to hold an enormous amount of water, and we'll be visiting a bioswale that actually is designed in a way that can actually provide flood mitigation. Uh, and then it's providing wildlife habitat. So instead of just providing conveyance, from point A to point B, it's providing that same conveyance, but it's providing all these other benefits as well. And uh, that's really an efficient way to uh, design our built environment. And uh, so with our BMP programs that we've been doing with, this is our second year of talking tours, is we want to showcase those best management practices that are on the ground. We want to take these things from just being lofty ideas to showing that these things are actually being done, being done successfully, and to show how these things work. And then we also do 
like to also, you know, talk about, you know, what worked as planned, but also what didn't work as planned. Uh, we're all on a learning curve when it comes to implementing a lot of these things and integrating it into our built environment. So uh, everything's not going to be perfect first time around. But instead of us, each person making the same mistake over and over again, by sharing this information, we can flatten that learning curve and have more successful projects uh, as a community. And so that's really what our focus is with this best management practice talk into our program is helping to share this information so that we can have a much better uh, and much greater success, success rate as we implement these BMPs. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working very closely with Crystal Lake on a variety of levels. They're great partners with the county sensible salting workshops and a variety of other things. Uh, but uh, Mike Madison is the uh, public works director and uh, Crystal Lake just really has done some amazing things. Uh, you look at uh, the Three Oaks uh, uh, facility and they incorporated green infrastructure there. Um, and th there was a learning curve there too, but uh, it's doing what it was designed to do. And uh, it's providing all these benefits on top of storage and conveyance. Uh, so we're very lucky to have uh, a community that is looking forward enough to uh, look at uh, how we can integrate nature-based solutions and green infrastructure uh, to address the problems that are occurring in our built environments. So I'd like to bring Mike Magnuson on, uh, and we'll be talking about three examples of green infrastructure that have been implemented right here in Crystal Lake. So thanks, Mike. Thank you. And there's your mic, Mike. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, kind of like Scott said, it's, it's a journey with green infrastructure. And kind of the three projects I'm going to talk about uh, go back to one we did back in 2012, then 2019, and then recent. And kind of doing it in that order, and we'll do that order in the tour, so you can kind of see like one of the early ones. And it was okay. I mean, they all work great. Um, but, you know, part of this is selling it to the public. And we've kind of learned as we've gone along the way that there's certain things you need to add and do to help gain that consensus and help gain that support. So I guess to start out, when we look at any kind of project, uh, the first things we ask are who are the stakeholders? And then what are the objectives of the project? Well, when you're looking at flooding, um, you have a lot of stakeholders that are either directly or indirectly involved in the project. You have the people who are actually flooding, um, but then when you think about it, uh, the areas that we're talking about are right by Crystal Lake. You have the people who use the lake recreationally. You have the people who live along the lake, fishermen, and the taxpayer, okay? When flooding happens, these two people are very loud and vocal. These people, they don't really care, <laughs> right? And, and I mean, not that, that they're not concerned about it, but you know, they're, they don't flood, you know, they're, they want to use the lake for recreation and they're very worried about what may happen, um, not so much the flooding. And then we have, a, oops, we have a lot of stakeholders who don't show up at public meetings that we need to take care of. And then we have some unwanted stakeholders, uh, especially when we're trying to create some natural habitat of, uh, that show up anyways, and we have to spend a lot of time and effort uh, to kind of keep them out of the project, if you will. And then finally, uh, all these projects are expensive, require money. So you have these stakeholders down here that are all part of it. Grant money is great, but there's always requirements. You have to make sure you meet those. Um, all these projects, um, except one, uh, you know, we're right by the lake, so we're dealing with the Corps of Engineers for permits. Uh, that brought in the Department of Natural Resources. Um, because Crystal Lake is very sensitive and very important, um, we always, whenever we get a permit, we always end up having indirectly through the Corps or directly coordinating with Fish and Wildlife and the Illinois Nature Preserve Commission. So all these people are part of a flooding project you know, even though you may not think of that right off the bat. So what are the objectives when we look at these projects? Well, if we wanted to just reduce flooding and that's all we cared about, that would be the solution. Just pipes and pumps and not really worry about much, much else. If we worried just about the environmental impacts, we would create some great habitat and have some great natural areas, but that may not solve the flooding. Okay? 
and we need to accommodate the area residents, okay? A lot of people just aren't there yet with natural habitats. Um, so what they want is that nice green lawn. So if we were to do a drainage project and put in a swale and just cover it with turf grass, they would like that, but that wouldn't solve our other problems. So really, you've got to balance all three on this. And, then, and that's really what's important. And you need to consider all of them. Because uh, the last thing you want to do is have a project, put it in, and have one of these stakeholders really not happy. Then you're not going to do your second project or your third one, right? So back in 2017 and 18, we had a lot of flooding. And it was really concentrated around the lake and some older sections of the town. You know, they were developed back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. People weren't thinking about stormwater management. There was no such thing as a detention pond or a retention pond. Uh, so when we had all those heavy rains, those areas flooded. We kind of looked at them. They each have kind of unique problems. So we broke them up into nine study areas. We kind of identified some near, mid, and long-term projects. And then dealing with the stakeholders is really important. We had over 20 public meetings and workshops on a lot of these projects. And we continue to do that. Everything from when we're thinking about a project to sitting down with the neighbors saying, hey, what's your concern? All the way through during construction saying, okay, the contractor's gonna do this tomorrow. We looked at uh, kind of how did we prioritize them. We kind of started with those areas where people's homes were getting flooded. It was impacting their house, their garage, um, roadway flooding that prevented people from getting in and out of a neighborhood. And then we looked at where there was a lot of flooding in yards, you know, was the public road part of that conveyance problem or part of the solution? So we came up with a whole bunch of projects, uh, 18 of them we've already constructed and we've got some future ones. So I think in the next five years, uh, hopefully we'll kind of reach the end here. The three I want to highlight is the East Street Swale, which is on the north side of the lake, uh, the North Shore subdivision, and then our most recent project is uh, over at Pine and Oriole in an older section of town. So for the East Street Swale, North Shore Drive would actually flood and become impassable. That was a huge concern to the residents because that meant no ambulance, no fire truck uh, to get in there. Um, so when we started talking about solutions to do that, you know, we were looking at having to convey water. Uh, the adjacent residents got very concerned about what are you doing to the lake? And you know, are you building this big river that when it floods, it's gonna sweep my dog and my kids away, okay? <clears throat> so if you're not familiar with the watershed for Crystal Lake, here's the lake down here. The watershed actually extends all the way up into Ridgefield. So all this is heading down for the lake. And this, what's outlined in yellow, is the neighborhood that would get completely cut off when North Shore Drive here would flood right there. Uh, this is the Woodland subdivision. Uh, there was a small emergency access to get people across, <clears throat> but it created a lot of problems. There was a small swale and it was your typical, what people like to see is mowed grass and very narrow. Um, <clears throat> that didn't really do a good job. So what was the solution? We constructed six short box culverts and when I mean short, I'm talking about height because we really wanted to limit how deep the water was. Um, what we wanted was a very wide swale with native plants and we wanted the water to move through there. So we wanted to move the flood water to help the flooding problem but we didn't want to be throwing it all into the lake in a narrow ditch and you spread it out, it kind of goes in like a sheet, they call it sheet flow, and have that all clean and in good shape when it hits the lake. And then we also wanted to improve the emergency access across the swale. Again, uh, that was used heavily by pedestrians and bicyclists. bicyclists. There's a lot of people that like to walk and bike the lake. Um, that's that other stakeholder this has nothing to do with flooding or native habitat, but they're part of the project. So here you can see during construction, and this is back in 2012. So there's those box culverts. You know, they're only about less than a foot wide, top to bottom. 
Here's the swale um, when it was first constructed and you can kind of see the bottom, meaning it's not very deep, okay? And then here's the improved access, emergency access that we did to the um, Woodland Drive subdivision uh, that's used by pedestrians and bicyclists. So what it looks like now, you're like 12 years later, 11 years later, um, we have a very nice densely vegetated swale. It's all native plants. When you get down to the lake, I mean, that, that's the outlet. So it's not a ditch, it's, it's just this flat area that's well vegetated. Problems with this, it's not very colorful. There's no bling, okay? And why I bring that up, because as we've moved on in our progression of projects, you know, we, when we went to the North Shore, it's like, well, it's gonna be native plants. Go look at the East Street Swale. And they all went, ew, <laughs> all right? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's not very colorful. That's probably the, the lessons learned here. So it is native vegetation. It's predominantly oh. sedges and uh, 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 rushes. Uh, so it is native plants, and these are all good things that provide good habitat for certain things, but it doesn't have a combination of forbs and the sedges and uh, uh, rushes. Yeah, when we, people that know all the prairie plants, and I'm far from an expert, or native plants, they go out there like, wow, this is great. But your average homeowner, they're just like, it's a lot of weedy green stuff. The North Shore neighborhood, which is just to the west of that, um, that subdivision got developed, I think, in the 20s or 30s. Um, repetitive flooding in the homes, very high groundwater, very organic soils, okay? Um, there was an old, failed private storm sewer tile system in part of the neighborhood. Um, but we would have people that their sump pumps would run all year. They'd post on Facebook, it would be the middle of January, and the thing's just churning, churning, churning. When we had our public meetings, there were a lot of people that says, you know what, I'm scared to go on vacation in the spring and summer. Because if I'm up in Wisconsin and I see a huge thunderstorm going from Crystal Lake, I know my house is going to flood and I'm not going to be there. So some people would actually change their vacation because of this. Standing water all year round. Uh, when we would get a heavy flood, it would get in people's backyards and it would stay there all summer. So aside from just looking at the water and the mosquitoes, after it's been there a couple months, it stinks really bad. When we started talking about solutions, they were very concerned about the lake and anything that we did, what would be the impact to the lake. They all wanted walkable streets, um, which is one thing we kind of, it kind of goes back to the native plants. They didn't want those native plants like right up to the road. You know, this subdivision is between the lake and Lippold Park. There's a lot of walking and biking going on. And the other thing, the, the aesthetics of it, the people that live next to these facilities have a mowed lawn, right? They don't want that native planting right up to the property line. You know, they're like, oh, there's gonna be mice and snakes and raccoons. So what we've done on all our projects is we've had a buffer of 10 to 20 feet that we put in as turf grass and we mow it like a lawn. And that has helped out a lot. Uh, so going from north to south, what would happen during a flood is this was a wooded, very poor quality wetland. Uh, a lot of silver maples, it was always dark, uh, never would dry out. We'd get a rain, there was no storage, so it would flood around this guy's house. It would go through this guy's crawl space. So it'd come in the north, come out the south, flood out his garage, hit the next neighbor, come down the street, and all end up in their backyard. And it would stay there all summer. And other backyards were like this. This is a house on Greenfield, it may be hard to see, but they have a boardwalk to their front door. Oh, wow. And that wasn't just during floods, that was kind of all year round, okay? So we came up with a design that created a storm sewer system with three BMP basins, no new outlets to the lake, all right? Our stormwater ordinance does not allow any new outlets to the lake. So we used the old tile system outlets from the 30s, that was our restrictor, if you will. We acquired 13 vacant lots for the stormwater storage. I mean, like, 
when we met with the residents, I kind of said, if you moved into a new subdivision, you have storm sewer, you have detention basins. You guys don't because the subdivision goes back to the 30s and really what we're doing is we're reverse engineering your subdivision. So we bought 13 lots and then we created these BMP basins for bulk storage and filtering of the storm water. And while our desire was water quality and using native plants for the benefits, um, we've ended up creating wildlife habitat, even though that wasn't one of our objectives. It's been kind of one of the side benefits of this. Uh, so this is the three streets on North Shore and all these blue areas are where we purchased vacant lots to create the basins. This was a very challenging project to construct uh, just with those organic soils and the groundwater and the fact that a lot of it just got hung up there. You know, the top couple of feet was just saturated. Uh, so we had a lot of difficulty during construction uh, dewatering these those areas, handling that water because it's muddy. We didn't want to just pump it into the lake. Um, and in fact, uh, we had some really problems on Greenfield <laughs> where we had the excavators kind of go out and they started sinking, then they started sinking faster and faster and faster. And uh, so we had a couple of them that were all the way up to the cab. Um, so it was, there was a lot of effort to kind of get those basins constructed. Um, that's what they look like now. We're gonna go out there and look. It's been three years. Um, the permit with the Corps of Engineers, you're required to have that maintenance and monitoring uh, with the contractor for three years. Um, one of them we're happy with, the other two are kind of, hmm. They're getting there, uh, so we've actually extended our contract with our consultant uh, for another couple of years uh, to do that maintenance and monitoring and uh, clear out the invasives. But uh, we are starting to get some nice stuff. And unlike the East Street Swale, we got some color uh, from the people are there. And you can see, here's that mode. This is along the street. This is adjacent to a backyard. So we've kept that 10 to 20 feet of turf grass. And we've got that uh, on all the basins. Uh, the last project we're gonna look at is Pine and Oriole. Uh, so to kind of give you a perspective, here's Route 14. Here's kind of the North Shore area I was talking about. Here's uh, 176. So it's right at um, Crystal Lake Avenue and, and 14. It's kind of back behind these commercial properties. It's a natural low spot. Um, if I had to guess, and this is just a guess, if you wound the clock back like a couple hundred years before Route 14 was there, I have a feeling this was all connected um, because the low point in these backyards is one foot above the lake, all right? <clears throat> That's the backyard. These houses have basements. So we had houses with a basement that was below the lake. So if you were to come to me as an engineer and saying, hey, you guys need to put in storm sewer to drain this out, my answer is drain it to where, right? We, we can't go below the lake. It's got to go, there's no place to put it. <clears throat> so it, um, you know, the water would pond there, it'd be several feet deep. It got into basements, into garages, and it would stay there until the residents pumped it out or we helped them pump it out, okay? So this was 2019, this wasn't even a bad flood. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see this whole area just fills up with water. And uh, this one house, you know, it's the driveway, it's the backyard, it was into their garage and then it got into their basement. It was a little heart-wrenching for me because most of the residents that lived here were retired. They were in their 70s and 80s. And they're out there at night and the next morning, you know, keeping their pumps going to, to try and pump the water out. So we, we had a meeting with them. Uh, you can see the five lots. That's kind of the area that floods. They kind of sat down and, and said, you know, there's, there's really no way to put in a storm sewer or pump this out or put into any underground storage. I said, would you guys consider selling your house? because really the only solution is to buy this property and create storage there. And, you know, we were very pleased that a lot of them, you know, they'd lived there 20, 30 years, that was their, their house. They were like, yeah, I, I think we'd do that. 
So we started with IEMA and FEMA applying for grants and that went nowhere. Um, kind of very disappointed with that process. Um, but then we finally applied to IDNR to the Office of Water Resources within DNR. And we got a grant which covered 100% of the costs. I, usually you get grants, it's 50-50, 60-40. They covered 100%. There was just a couple of things they didn't. So it covered the appraisals, the acquisition, the demolition, and the restoration. Now, the city council's position was actually the same as the grant position, is we're not gonna push anybody out of their house. So it had to be voluntary. And we worked cooperatively with them, um, you know, because some of them, well, I gotta buy a new house, it's gonna take time. It's like, that's fine. Um, so we worked with a lot of them and, and it worked out very well to kind of meet the closing dates. Um, so these are the five houses and you, you can see where the flood water uh, this is the one with the basement that's below the level of the lake. <clears throat> so we excavated anywhere from just three inches all the way to three feet. We created over 170,000 gallons of storage. Uh, we provided all that native planting because this doesn't drain anywhere. So it's gonna sit there after a flood and we want those plants to, to wick up that water and get rid of it. Um, landscaping was a big deal. It was kind of interesting when we had our public meetings. The people that lived opposite of the homes we were going to buy, they were like, well, right now I look out my front yard and I see another front yard and a house. And you're going to tear all this down and it's going to be a natural area, but I'm going to be looking at the back of the parking lots of the you know, buildings on 14. And what are people going to think? You know, we've got these nice lawns. So what we did is we said, okay, we're gonna keep the front yards. So we limited our excavation, except for one area, to the houses on back. So when you pull down the street, you turn the corner, your view shed is still mowed lawns. And then when you get up there, okay, you get to the right and you've got the natural area. Very worried about the aesthetics. Um, we've done some planting, unfortunately, with the drought. When you go out there, we're struggling to get our trees and bushes to grow here. Um, that was the only thing the DNR didn't pay for because they said that's not related to the flooding. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Um, so I think the city out of this, this is like $1.2 million for the whole project and I think we've only spent like 25 on landscaping. So, And they were also concerned about the wildlife, you know, raccoons and mice and snakes. And so we kept a 20 foot buffer around the whole thing. And then plus we kept this area. So we're like, you know, you want to take your dog out for a walk? You can just walk around the whole thing. We'll keep that all mowed and, and keep that buffer. Um, one of the things we did with that house that the basement was below the lake level, all the other houses, we tore them down, we knocked in the foundations, scooped it all out and filled it in. Um, we were looking on other agencies and we actually found this in Detroit in some of the old areas uh, when the economy crashed and whole neighborhoods were vacant, um, they created these basement cisterns. So what they did is they kept the foundation, cut holes through it to let the water out, um, filled it in with loose rock, and what we did is we kind of put a riser here uh, with an inlet so we could put a pump, a small one, it's like a sump pump, and have that pump the water out after a storm just to help with the backyards. So it's big, but we covered it up with fabric, we covered it up with topsoil, so when you're out there, you don't even know it's there. But that helps pull that water down if we get a huge flooding event. Um, so we started in December. So we learned our lesson on North Shore, don't go digging in swampy, mucky in the spring so you get your equipment stuck. And I had the houses down in December, January. The only negative was my engineering staff was not real happy because when I looked in the construction photos, I found this. Um, so he, he did obviously didn't like working outside in January when it's minus 12. Uh, so this was in the fall. Uh, you know, as Scott said, these native plants take years to develop. So we planted it, you know, also seeded with a cover crop. Uh, so in that fall, it just, uh, you know, looked like, a, you know, more like a farm field. We've told the residents, we're up front in all these projects that these areas will still flood, you know, during a flood, but 
it's not going to be in your house and it's not going to be there all summer. It will go away. And then we have our contractor on the hook for three years. Um, most of these, I said, we're going even further. Um, so after I told all the residents, yeah, it's not going to be there all summer, obviously that puts all the pressure on me. Um, so what happened last weekend? We got 3.5 to 3.8 inches of rain. So where do you think I was at midnight? I was checking on all these things. So the, yeah, that kind of 10 to like 1 in the morning was the rain. So this is the far back corner, the very low spot. So Saturday morning, it was into these folks' backyards, so like maybe 20 feet, six foot sections of fence. But when I went back there on Monday, it's gone. It's all back in here, and I'm sure we're out here today, it's even drier. So our kind of rule of thumb is 72 hours, you know, on flooding is, is to, you know, have that water go away. So we're very pleased with this one. You can kind of see the progression from tearing down the houses to the fall uh, to this summer. Um, the other thing we did on this, we talk about the color and the bling, is I kind of called in the cavalry and uh, had uh, WPPC come out and uh, Nancy and Patty have been a huge help. Uh, one thing we've learned on these projects is we seed them with the native seed mix. Um, but people want that instant gratification, so really what you need to do if you're going to do these projects is have plugs so they can see that right away. And you need to do more with the wildflowers because that's what sells it, you know. Uh, so what have we learned? Those turf areas and borders for pedestrians and access are huge to selling it. You need to have color. Um, you need to do more than just seed with the plugs. Um, we added trees at Pine and Oriole. We'll be adding them at North Shore along the edges, not down in the basins. Because uh, people just don't like it when you go in there and, you know, clear cut. You know, they're, like, they're, they're just horrified with what you've done. So you really need to put some trees back. Uh, rely on your contractors and your consultants, um, but you also need volunteers, uh, as we found out. Um, the basins create wildlife. Probably the best compliment I got for Pine and Oreo is somebody called up uh, Mike Wazinski, our public works manager, and said, hey, I saw some sandhill cranes in there over the weekend. I'm like, okay, that's better than the council or the neighbors or anybody else. We, we did a good job. And then uh, as Scott and I were talking, you know, the Corps of Engineers requires that three years, but that's really a minimum. Um, what we're finding on the North Shore is we're extending that contract because it's, it's more than three years to get everything going the way it should be. A quick uh, future project we're working on, I don't want to go too long, is south of the lake. So here's the lake, you may not realize this, but where this is where Crystal Creek starts. It kind of comes down, winds around by the country club, uh, but then when it goes back through here, it goes into a storm sewer. Because uh, back when they built the schools, they were like, oh, we don't want to deal with this, so put it in a pipe, bury it. Uh, that pipe then goes behind south and in front of Lundahl, and then the creek comes back out. Uh, so we've been working on this for many years, a lot of stakeholder meetings. We've been meeting with the school district for over a year. And I get it, they're teachers, they've got recess, they don't want the kids coming in muddy, they don't want the you know kids getting swept away. Uh, so we have worked with them. We have an understanding. They're happy with our design. So they're all on board. And hopefully next year we'll start reestablishing the creek. So we're actually going to rip up that pipe and put the creek back behind south and in front of Lundahl. Um, and it'll, it's kind of what the cross section will look like. Um, it's all going to be obviously native. Uh, we're going to have a little bench. Uh, we're going to do a lot of kind of cross veins and riffles to kind of encourage habitat and uh, get that going. Um, we've applied for grant funding uh, to help because that's like a $4 million project. And hopefully we'll start in 24. Um, that's a two-year project. Um, you're doing construction projects by schools. You've got a very narrow window. You basically got the summer, then you got to stop, and then wait for the next summer and come back and do it again. So we'll be doing that over two summers. Uh, with that, are there any questions? Well, I want to say I love the, the Crystal Creek daylighting project. Uh, Dave Sherbert's my cousin, so you probably... Oh, okay. Yeah. We're, we're really excited about that. 
But I just had a question, Mike, about, so you talked about all these projects are, are you know, organic soil. So my question is kind of the history. Like, you know, people put, so this is kind of wetland soils, and people put homes in there. Were they summer homes? And so they didn't <laughs> worry so much about these problems? Or, and then is it also a combination of more impervious surface over the years, and so the flooding has gotten worse? So the North Shore neighborhood started out as summer homes. So they were small little summer cottages. They were very small lots on well and septic, and yeah, people were only there during the summers. And then, I, you know, I think kind of around the 50s, all of a sudden they switched over to all year round housing. Um, you know, now people are there all year round. Um, impervious was some of it, but not a lot. Um, the, yeah, the soils are all organic. Um, you know, we've, even a couple of the lots we bought looked like mowed lawn, but when we had our consultants go out and look at them, they're like, Per the Chicago District Corps of Engineers, this is a wetland. So yeah, I, I think that whole subdivision was all wetland. You know, back, you know, aerial photography only goes back to the 30s and the subdivision was already there, so. Um, and Why we have a, a county stormwater ordinance now that would prevent that type of activity. Exactly. Do you have plans for ongoing maintenance after the establishment period of these Areas? Yes, we have uh, a contractor that we put out a contract every couple of years because um, we have other native areas at Three Oaks and we've got a little bioswale in downtown. So, yeah, we have a qualified contract and that's just part of our annual budget. I'm just wondering, you mentioned your stakeholders. Um, has the Chris Lake Park District been, had a role at all? Oh, yes. Um, they were a huge help. We worked very closely with them on the North Shore project. Um, can you uh, repeat the question at least in brief so we can hear? Oh, so the project was, uh, you know, what, what was the partnership? Have we partnered with the Park District? And they've, they've been, yes, they've been great partners with us. So in the North Shore subdivision, all this is Lippold Park. And what's kind of interesting about Crystal Lake is most lakes have like a river or creek flowing into it and then another one flowing out. There is no creek river flowing into Crystal Lake. It's all groundwater fed. There is an old drainage district, so old farm tiles that goes all the way back up to Ridgefield. That's part of what drives that area. Um, that still is actually there and somewhat functioning. Um, when the Park District uh, developed Lippold, they actually intercepted those tiles and created these lagoons as, you know, big treatment filter trains. And then the other thing they did is along, so here's the three streets that had all the flooding. Uh, they created a berm along their path, if you ever walk through that section of Lippold. So they've got a berm uh, with a restrictor in it. So when there's a lot of heavy rainfall, this actually acts as a detention pond and meters that out. And then we've now put in our ponds that are designed to accept that and kind of meter it out. Uh, so both of us together, I think have made a huge difference for this neighborhood. Sorry, one more question. I just wanted to ask you about Lakewood on the south side of the lake. Are there projects scheduled for over there too? Yes, um, once we daylight the creek, that will provide the opportunity to improve some of the storm sewers in that area. Um, if you ever drive just south of the lake where the weir, there's Broadway. We put two new big culverts in there. If you ever look at them, one of them has this big metal plate <laughs> on the side. And that's because we've designed those culverts to handle the flood flow, but because the creek is in a pipe by Lundahl, it can't handle it. So we've bulkheaded our culverts until we open up the creek. And that'll help, you know, manage the floodwaters. And what I try to tell people with flooding is not the volume, it's kind of the how much you get and how much time. And with all these projects, if we can move stormwater earlier in a storm and let it go through these native filters at a low speed rather than 
having a flood where the water all of a sudden builds up and then just whoosh it goes. Because uh, that's when you get the pollutants and the erosion and, and stuff like that. So uh, hopefully if we get the creek open, we can look at trying to improve some of the storm sewers in that neighborhood. Uh, east of Lipwold and north of the lake, that, you know, the city land there, what have you done or what are your plans to do, to do with the latest stormwater management plan the update that you just did? Is there, I mean, it's all natural right now and my perception is nothing's been done. There may be old drain tiles when it was perhaps farmland and then it's just been forced adapter or not. I, I don't know the history of that, but could you uh, explain a little bit of that space? Yeah. So she's talking about all this right. property here and here. So the city actually owns all this right. and all the way up here. Um, one of the projects we did very early on, because it was kind of a quick win, is uh, these people were flooding quite a bit. And just as you said, there was old field tiles that went through here uh, that were no longer functioning. So we actually started way up here, almost to 176, and put in a new field tile down along here that dumps in the Cove Pond. And that's helped out this area a lot. I mean, someday, you know, it would be nice to restore this because this is just a super dense buckthorn forest. Um, but, you know, we've got to find a grant that has a really good match, like the DNR grant that pays for everything. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd like to kind of try and restore this area long term. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, one more. Um, did any of the grants come with any kind of water quality, uh, like monitoring at all as part of the requirement, or, or no? No. no. Okay. But we actually we we do do water quality. We've got a network of monitoring wells kind of around the lake, and you know I talked about Crystal Lake being groundwater fed. And when we have the flooding, um, one of the questions people always say is, well, the weir, should it be wider? Should it be deeper? And, you know, what should we do with the weir? And as an engineer, I'm like, I don't know how much water is flowing into the lake and out surface versus how much is flowing underground in. And a lot of it flows out underground to the south. So we actually were wrapping up a, we're not, um, so that kind of really heady kind of study, that's the United States Geological Survey. So we actually funded a project. Um, they're wrapping it up. Hopefully we get a draft report this year. Um, they've been, you know, with these, they've been, we've been helping them with these groundwater wells, monitoring all that, and to come up with an idea of how is water moving in and out of the lake. We also monitor those groundwater wells throughout the year, you know, just to kind of keep an eye on what's coming in and, you know, making sure there's no pollutants or contaminants in there. Well, and the hydrologist that is working on that project is the same hydrologist that uh, the county works with with our monitoring well network. So the, uh, the scientist is very familiar with uh, McHenry County and uh, we're all very excited to, to hear how that uh, uh, project comes about. Um, I've heard that uh, Crystal Lake is a really good water quality. What would be the level you would consider? Um, boy, I, I don't know if I could, you know, kind of categorize that. Um, you know, we've, we've just been studying it and monitoring it, you know, with all our, to make sure it's not going down, um, kind of keeping it at that high level. But, uh, yeah, it's um, kind of, I guess, like anything around here, phosphorus, is an issue. Um, I think other than that, it's, it's pretty good. Um, we don't it's an exceptionally clear lake uh, yeah. because it's largely groundwater fed. As the contribution of surface water in, in, increased, uh, that did impact water quality to a certain degree. Uh, and I think that is actually what prompted some of the efforts around the lake. Uh, Crystal Lake hired Hay and Associates 20 some years ago uh, to do plans to protect the lake but it's that groundwater fed uh, water uh, that's cool and clean uh, that uh, is really what makes Crystal Lake uh, 
Crystal Lake. Um, and so uh, groundwater uh, systems really are, are a big part of that. Yeah, any development that occurs in the watershed, they have to infiltrate. We don't let them right. run it off. And it is a glacial uh, uh, remnant feature, uh, and so the, the morphology of a natural lake is completely different than a constructed lake. And so that's another reason why Crystal Lake is uh, highly regarded as a high quality lake, is because it is a natural feature, not a completely artificial. There is a, a structure that, uh, you know, dictates how high the water will get. But it, it, it is a natural lake as opposed to a reservoir where they've dammed up a stream or something like that. The, the morphology of those types of lakes are completely different than a natural lake like Crystal Lake. It was just so this is the East Street Swale that I was talking about. Um, oh, we got some bikers coming through. Nice right. seeing this put to use. Thanks. Couldn't have timed it better, guys. Yeah. <laughs> As I mentioned, a critical stakeholder. Um, this does get used very heavily. Um, but, you know, the original problem was North Shore would go underwater, and all these neighborhoods here had no access for police or fire. Um, so we actually raised North Shore a little bit, put in these box culverts, and if you look at them, they're not very tall, and that was intentional uh, to limit the flow. And then, you know, this has now been, you know, 11 years of kind of managing this, and I think we've got it in pretty good shape. Uh, obviously ongoing. Um, we have somebody come through, one of our contractors, and um, kind of do our maintenance and monitoring each year. Um, we have burned this a couple of times as well. Um, but what's what's really nice when we get done, if we want to walk down to the end, you can kind of see where it hits the lake, and it's it's just flat and wide. You know, you don't really see any form of a ditch, and the water literally just sheets out uh, during a flood into the lake. It's all clear. It's all been filtered, and uh, we're not creating any erosion into the lake. Um. So I was just going to point out some of the vegetation. Um, uh, so it's not, uh, often we'll plant a combination of grasses and forbs. So in a natural system, that's what wants to fill that space, is a combination of grasses and flowering plants. And so if you only show the, the showy stuff, the, the, uh, the flowering plants, grasses are going to move in and they're not going to be the grasses that you want to have there. So it's really important to kind of put a, both a combination of grasses and forbs and take control over what is actually going to occupy that area. Uh, in this case, there's not a lot of for, forbs, uh, but everything that we see in here, or most everything that we see in here, is actually really good. Uh, this is a, uh, a dark green rush. Uh, so these are actually the flowers of the dark green rush. Uh, and uh, pass it around and just uh, take a look at the stem. Uh, that has a square stem. Uh, the next plant that we're going to show is wool grass. Uh, once again, this is a flower of the wool grass, and uh, just kind of roll it around your fingers and observe what uh, shape the stem is. Um, these are identification characteristics we use to identify the plants in the field. And then uh, this is a uh, big blue stem. So this was the stalwart of our tall grass prairie. And uh, it's not a wetland plant, but it's uh, occupying the space on the uh, upper edges of the uh, the swale and its uh, common name is uh, often uh, referred to as turkey foot uh, and uh, you can kind of observe why it might be like that as I pass this around and uh, you know you can look at this as being a uh, you know a filtration system as the water is moving through it's hitting the plants slowing things down and it's actually getting cleaned as it passes through it's both interacting with the soils and the vegetation and so water on that end is going to be a lot cleaner than water on this end as it passes through and the shape of it allows for an enormous amount of water storage. So you can design these things to act as flood control structures in addition to a conveyance feature. Um, and then uh, 
uh, it, and I do see that we do have some flowering plants in there. You can see the purple out in the, the distance, and we'll, I guess we'll probably get a closer look as we walk by. That's uh, swamp milkweed, and uh, so A, it's a very pretty plant. It's a great plant for landscaping, and then it's also one of the, the species that supports uh, monarchs. So I think most people probably know, but when monarchs are in their caterpillar phase, they can only eat milkweed, and so having milkweed is then supporting uh, monarch butterflies, uh, monarch but butterfly habitat. Uh, I also do see that you can see the, uh, the, the plant with the really wide uh, leaf. Uh, that is iris. So that's blue flag iris. So that's actually a very beautiful flower. Another great ornamental plant. Uh, they're a uh, native plant that can be used for uh, uh, landscaping. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about when we talk about green infrastructure and multiple benefits, you can design your uh, system to be a, what is often referred to as a treatment train. And so you can have multiple BMPs interconnected so that the water is getting cleaned as it passes through the system. So you can have a bioswale capturing runoff from your parking lots and then that feeding into a naturalized detention basin. And so this is filtering out sediments and pollutants before it gets to your detention basin so that the detention basin is actually then able to uh, last longer because it's not receiving sediments and the water quality going into that basin is going to be higher quality so you can actually have higher quality vegetation in that uh, detention basin. And so you can stack these BMPs together to have uh, uh, progressively improved benefits throughout that treatment train. And uh, so there really is a lot that can go into uh, designing green infrastructure. And uh, this is a great example of a bioswale that's providing a multitude of functions uh, and has been in place since you said 2012. And so, you know, like, like I said, the plants that I pointed out are all considered really good quality native plants. So we're not seeing a ton of flowering plants, but it's all very high quality vegetation. So I'll give this back to you and you can narrate as we go along. Yeah, so if we got a moment, let's walk down to the end. And I just want to show you how flat and wide that is. And I've been out here in heavy floods, and the water's only this deep. But it's moving a lot. It's a high volume, and it's all getting filtered as it heads down. You look at this, and it's all well vegetated. It's got those native plants with the deep roots. We never have any erosion coming out of here. And you know, if you walk down there, you can see how flat it is. Yeah, you don't really have any rivulets or anything. It's just this nice sheet flow out into the lake. Huh? Is it difficult to keep it like this? or did you... During the winter, yeah. <laughs> actually we have a lot of wave action. So we'll get sediment from the lake that'll kind of berm up. So in the spring, we've got to kind of come down here at the shoreline and kind of scrape that off to, to keep that flat. Yeah. Um, but that's really all we do in the spring is just whatever damage from the winter. We're really don't mess with this at all. And it moves a lot of water. I remember when more short that it was a And one thing I, uh, as far as like the flatness, because uh, you were talking about this in your presentation, uh, we have a, a pipe that's moving a water in a concentrated flow. Uh, which can actually be a big source of erosion. We typically will have to put some type of energy dissipation, so riprap, so the water hits the riprap and settles down. Uh, another technique that we'll use sometimes is a level spreader. So the pipe will run water to a, a horizontal pipe uh, that uh, lets everything out in a level flow. Uh, and uh, that reduces erosion, uh, provides greater opportunity for the water to actually settle into the ground. If it's moving fast at high volume, it's not really having an opportunity to infiltrate down. And so this flat level surface providing a level sheet flow is actually then returning the water in a much slower natural uh, flow back into the lake as opposed to a concentrated flow. So uh, this would be another example of you know, designing it, it to emulate nature. This is great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you're get you're getting the color in here. It'll yeah. keep coming in. Uh, so like, you've got all the right plants coming in. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was but corrected on the plant that I was pointing out, and uh, I will take one. You confirm. Just to show. But uh, look at the leaf structure of this. So most leaves are either opposite, so on direct uh, opposite sides of the of the stem, or alternate. So you have a leaf here and a leaf here. Uh, this is in a world pattern. So that they're opposite, but in leaves of four uh, around the, the stem. And so that's a pretty unique uh, growth form. Uh, uh, there are only a few other plants in our area that have that uh, type of uh, leaf structure. Um, so it's, uh, we can actually uh, use that type of thing to identify it in the middle of winter. Uh, you can see where the, the stems are. But a very so pretty plant. What's the name of it? Uh, Joe Pie Weed. And uh, so Joe Pye was a Native American who showed uh, uh, settlers how to use uh, the, the plant as uh, the folklore has it. But it's a beautiful plant both for a natural area and for landscaping purposes. I think we're on our uh, talking tour where we had uh, Algonquin, uh, Village of Algonquin, Michelle Zimmerman from the Village of Algonquin talking about how they use native areas. Half of their natural or half of their open space is turf grass, half of it's native. Uh, the native, uh, they have it to the point where they need two site visits a year. The turf grass is week after week after week. So the cost of maintaining their turf grass areas is exponentially higher than their native areas. And that's because they went in and uh, uh, approach it just like this gentleman was talking about. You know, eliminate that seed bank, uh, do your management at the beginning, and it gets easier and easier. Uh, so I'm going to hand this back to you and stop babbling. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know at what level uh, you folks uh, are familiar with the, with these systems, with these native uh, planted systems, but uh, one, one of the, you know, a, a lot of people, including the highway departments and other people I don't want to mention, they think you plant it and you walk away. Well, that's, it just turns into a, an asshole pretty quickly if you, if you do that. And um, so one, a very important part of, of getting these things to where you want them is you just don't let seeds fall. You know, if you missed it herbiciding or you missed it, you know, hand weeding or whatever, you, you go back in there and you deadhead them and you take those seeds off site because some of them, like, you know, purple loosestrife and um, uh, teasel and that, it's like breaking a, mi a mirror, you know. You got seven years of bad luck if you let one season of seed go, you know, and and so that's a very critical step. That's that's more critical than, you know, being thorough with the herbicides or the hand pulling or weeding or whatever. Just don't let those seeds, you know, fall because it's bad. The sweet clovers, that's a real bad one and up one year. Those seeds last 60 years in the soil. So, you know, if you leave a bunch of them seed, you know, you might as well give that up. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that, but you know, that's just to just to stress the point. You know. Yeah, so the the better job you do in that first three years, the easier it's going to be throughout the life of of the project. And uh, you know, so uh, thrilled to hear that you're out here uh, doing the work. And uh, uh, you know, I'm actually pretty pleased with most of what I'm seeing here. I do see some uh, 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 of the. Uh, uh, giant reed, the Phragmites, but uh, um, it does look like it's being under control. And if you don't know what Phragmites is, Phragmites, I, I consider it one of our greatest invasives in the area. Uh, it uh, will typically uh, start out in a wet area and then spread out, and I've seen it where it, it spreads uh, by roots, uh, and so I've seen where the, it sends the roots up hundreds of feet up a hill. So as it gets its foothold, and then once it gets a foothold, it can grow everywhere, and it'll grow to be 15 feet tall it doesn't let anything else grow uh, around it and uh, it really doesn't provide any habitat cattail is another one cattail our uh, native cattail hybridized with European cattail and now is an invasive species uh, but at least it is providing water quality treatment and it provides some habitat the Phragmites provides no habitat at all and it just uh, is so aggressive uh, uh, the main way I know to take care of it is uh, what we call the glove of death uh, you have a rubber glove on and then you put a cotton glove on and you can spray herbicide on your hand or dip your hand in herbicide and then run your hand up the stem and you have to do that to each stem in order
order to do that. And so your best bet is not to let it get out of hand in the first place. But you need it to start to grow so that you can uh, get rid of it. But uh, like the gentleman was saying, you don't want to let the things go to seed. You know, you're, you're racing time to uh, let it grow enough so that you can take care of it, but not enough so that it can go to seed. So I'm going to hand that off to you. Um. Yeah, we were we were asked to to not uh, cause dead cattails and dead fragmites right. until after the <laughs> yeah <laughs> after so. the tour. He'll, he'll be in next week. We yeah. kind of we hit Monday, the pause Tuesday button. Tuesday is, is our <laughs> is our window for coming in here and taking care of that stuff. Yeah. Um, really the only thing I wanted to add, I know somebody had the question about the park district and you kind of look down the street, you can see that berm uh, that they constructed there and uh, you know so they've kind of holding the water back uh, as well as what we're doing here, so. So Rob, are you saying like, so we have environmental defenders and McHenry County interns here. Who awesome. have spent, they've spent their summers cutting down sweet clover, cutting down teasel. Lots of teasel. Parsnip. Oh, well, did parsnip. you get any burns? Yep. <laughs> so that was my qu yeah. that was oh, my question. Sorry. Yeah. While parsnips already gone to seed, you'd go out with gloves and try and I, cut I off do. the heads into Absolutely. a bag. Absolutely. Okay. Try. I spray it when it's rosette, but then if it's flower, you know, you can you can weed whack it. That's okay. You know, at yeah. the at the base, but you got to be careful. You know, the the highway departments cut their people out. They say don't do it because you've seen some of those mass amounts along the highway they get that sap on themselves and they're fried yeah you know so this is our pine street oriole street project um you know it's kind of hard to believe it's only been what two years um but there used to be five houses here uh, so kind of as i mentioned during the presentation we wanted to preserve the front yards so if you're driving down the street it kind of just looks like a regular street which is what the neighbors were concerned about and then we kind of kept this area for them to you know use if they wanted to you know put a picnic table or whatever and then you can kind of see where we've kept a you know 15 foot swath all the way around um, that helps us with the mowing but it's also so you can walk around the whole site if you want to um, where you see that uh, little electrical box and meter, that's our basement cistern. So it's all covered up and plants growing on top of it, but uh, there's a pump down in there and then that, you know, after we get a lot of water, the groundwater comes up really high. It's a small pump, so it's not that much bigger than a regular sump pump. And that just pumps it out and puts it in the storm sewer. Um, so yeah, like I said, over in that back corner, that's the low spot. And, you know, here we are a week from that three and a half, three point eight inches uh, rainstorm, and you know the the plants have done a great job sucking that up, and it's all off the the backyards where before, when the houses were here, uh, we'd get a real heavy rain like that. It would be all the way up to that retaining wall, almost in his garage, and then the property here was actually built on fill, so then the water would get trapped there. It was kind of interesting when we were. <laughs> uh, putting together the engineering side of the demolition plans, we dug some test holes. So the house that was right here, we dig down and there was four to six inches of topsoil. Then we kept going, there was a foot of clay, and then you know what we hit? Topsoil. Yeah. <laughs> so we took out all that clay that was here, it was all these, you know these houses were built in the 50s, um, but they were, it was all fill, trucked in. Um, so. We, we were able to get back down to, you know, as close as we could to that native grade. Mike, who is it that you said took down their fence? Um, the, that house that had that, the white fence, it used to go all the way across the back. And yeah, when I came out here last week, I'm like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> Do you have any pictures of that soil you were just talking about? Yeah, yeah, I've, I, we did a little presentation. I, we kind of have a little, picture and with the depths. Did you share that with us? Yeah. Yeah. So where's the basement film in? Do you have that? It's just to the where the electrical box is, just to the left. That that was where the house was and so yeah you can't even tell it's there. 
Um, but we, we kept the walls and the floor, we just cored holes through them and filled it up with rock and then fabric and then uh, soil back on top. You want to talk a little bit about the uh, vegetation and uh, how the, the different types of planting zones and, uh, and as far as who's uh, taking uh, care of things? Yeah, we, uh, since this project is still within that three years, um, we have the, the contractor who was part of the original project that we put out for bid. It's uh, Baxter Women Ecological Services is handling that one. And uh, this one, kind of like I said, we've kind of learned as we've gone along the way, um, used different seed mix for up on the slopes as compared to what's down in the more wet areas. Um, we wanted you know, a lot more of the, the forbs and the, the color um, because as I mentioned, that, that really sells it. Um, that's, you know, when you're talking about doing one of these and you're talking to the residents, that's, that's what they want to see. They want to see the flowers and the color and, uh, yeah, I think everybody along here has been very happy, um, and the trees and the bushes. So, you know, over the years that'll grow up and shade those parking lots or screen those parking lots because that, that was a concern of all the folks that are, are here now. Um, but everybody's been pleased with it, even after the last rain. I talked with the homeowner on the corner, and she said it's it's like five ten it's ten feet away from where it used to come. So we think of that as a big benefit. So. But uh, you've also got uh, the wildflower plant and propagation committee helping. So you've got an area that was seeded and then you've got an area that was also planted with plugs. And uh, I can't remember if we were talking about this, but that's a, a, a good strategy when we would work with uh, uh, park districts who have uh, uh, are going from turf to native. Uh, and uh, where I would really kind of sell this with the park districts or, uh, or municipalities is if they've got low areas that are prone, prone to flooding, uh, those are hard areas to maintain. Their equipment will get stuck in there, they'll create ruts, it's unsightly. So those are ideal locations to do a turf to native project. And uh, you know, it's more expensive to use plugs, but you get more immediate gratification. Uh, seed takes a long time for the seed to germinate, to build roots, and then to flower like th three years later. With uh, plugs, you plant them, and you can get much more immediate gratification. And so, what we would work with the uh, the clients to do is we would plug the areas that are high profile. So, if we've got a, a footpath that's going through the area, uh, we would uh, uh, put plugs near the entrance of the walkway through the area, uh, seed the rest of it, and that way you're reducing the overall cost of the plugs and only putting them where, where they're absolutely necessary. And so, what we've got here is kind of that type of an example. So you've got an area here that uh, is planted with plugs. It's kind of right next to the road, a high profile area. And uh, you can see it's already attracting wildlife. I came out here uh, Saturday after the big storm and uh, it was doing exactly what it was designed to do. So you could see the extent of the water, and uh, uh, but it didn't go beyond where it would be in a man manageable space. Uh, location. So I mean it really was doing what it was supposed to. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, butterflies that were in here were incredible. I was I spent like an hour trying to get photos of the butterflies. Uh, all of a sudden the birds took off and uh, a Cooper's hawk swooped down and landed in that tree over there. Uh, so you've got uh, uh, you know things taking care of uh, uh, the insects. Uh, you've got dragonflies uh, doing their job. You've got the butterflies doing their job. The birds doing their job. Uh, so I mean it's really providing a, a, a really good habitat. Uh, so you're getting the flood prevention, the habitat, the aesthetic beauty, uh, and uh, a certain amount of infiltration as well. Uh, that's then feeding the recharge to Crystal Lake. So you're getting all these benefits uh, in, adduce, in addition to reducing flooding. Uh, I, I don't know, I refer to this as regional detention. I don't know if that's uh, a characterization that you would uh, agree with or not. Um, yeah. But it's providing uh, uh, flood mitigation for this this area. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, but can you talk a little bit about the relationship with the WPPC and uh, how they did this and what how they're maintaining it? Yeah, so they've, they've just been a tremendous help to us um, both here and we've got some uh, bioswales in the downtown, um, but really helping us dress this up. 
um, you know, kind of making it aesthetic so people take note. Uh, the next thing we want to do here is we want to put up some signage um, because, you know, and anybody who's planning on doing this, <laughs> you know, feel free to, you know, use this as an example and hopefully when we get that signage up, um, you know, we can kind of point people over here because we want this to really be marketing for other projects we may do similar to this. Mm -hmm. And um, they've just been a tremendous help because uh, they're a lot better at, at kind of the, the fine points here and uh, kind of helping us kind of work this along uh, the walking path here. Well, um, is there anything else you want to add uh, to the stop? Uh, we're at 3 o'clock now, so uh, um, yeah, do people have questions that they'd like to address while we're out here, uh, either this site or any other site? Mike? Um, oh, sure. So outside of this pump, that's the only discharge point, so otherwise everything just evapotranspires, and how about in the winter, like how does it how does it perform, or how have you seen it so far? Are you, are you having to pump a lot, or it just kind of is a sink? No, I actually was kind of surprised how little we pumped. So when I was out here Monday evening, you know, I walked over to, you know, see if the pump was still going, and it had stopped. And, yeah, that was, that was the big problem with this. There was no place to put the water. So that's really what led us down the, the path to, you know, we got to figure out a way to buy these homes and, and uh, create this because there's, there's no solution. There's no outlet. more questions on any of the sites we visited? Um, have you here, seen... Here. I know originally you had some skepticism from neighbors and stuff. Have you seen a positive reaction now that they've noticed that their basements aren't underwater? Great question. More so even from the people that didn't flood. Okay. Who really weren't excited about, you know, this weedy mess. You know, that's what their fear was. And, uh, you no, know, a lot of them, when we see the neighbors walking by, they're like, wow, this really looks nice. And, you know, that, that's really what we need to sell these in other areas. Okay, so you've seen a positive change in public perception? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and just to add to that, so uh, uh, we have uh, native gardens, demonstration gardens at the county administration building. Uh, and when I started working here, uh, you know, seven years ago or so, I'd be out working on the garden and 95% of the comments were snide comments about how they're going to have to come back here with their lawnmower. Uh, and uh, now over 95% of the comments are all positive. Uh, and most of the people at least have some level of awareness of why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, you know, the benefit, whether it's a pollinator habit, habitat or for flood mitigation, uh, most of the public seems to have some level of awareness and uh, the, the response that I get is, is overwhelmingly positive. I will sit here some of those snide comments, but it's not the main uh, uh, comment that I hear like it used to be. Okay. So I do think that there's been enough uh, uh, information out through different organizations, uh, in the press, and visibly seeing things on the ground. That's the whole reason we do this BMP talking tour is so that people can see things that are actually being done on the ground. And and uh, that has a lot more resonance to people than just hearing about it. Um, and so I, I really think that uh, these wonderful things that Crystal Lake and others are doing really have uh, uh, benefit.